This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. Hey everybody, it's Aaron Norris again. We've got John Bohannon with BuildZig for our second interview. Last interview, you talked a lot about sort of the basics of funds control, um, what it is, how the industry got started, and the basic process of uh, the players in the mix and how to go about setting it up and why it's required here if you're regulated under the Bureau of Real Estate. And, you know, it just protects a lot of the different players, including the general contractor, the borrower, the lender. It just makes a lot of sense. And it was actually probably one of the best things that... Uh, came out of the overlay uh, from California on the CFPB stuff from Dodd-Frank. <laughs> uh, uh, John, I, I recently ran into you at the California Mortgage Association, and that's a private industry association for private money lenders. And one of the only reasons I go is I get bored to death by all the uh, attorneys that show up to describe all the different regulations that we're under here in California. So, <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of that. Yeah, Just curious, when... When you're selecting a funds control company, um, who you under California law, you mentioned last show that it's the Department of Business Oversight. Did I hear that correctly? The, the DBO? DBO, yes. Um, and uh, it's called a joint control escrow license. And interestingly enough, that has nothing to do with the traditional escrow company. Technically speaking, a regular escrow company doing, you know, buy or sell of a, of a property, a house, um, cannot actually engage in the practice of funds control. So that is a special license called the Joint Control Escrow License, and it's uh, regulated quite differently. Uh, we are subject to uh, minimum uh, threshold requirements for assets, and we have to have regular audits. Uh, we, we are required to do an annual audit. Uh, there, there could be random audits from the DBO in between. Uh, so a lot of requirements, fidelity bond. Of course, uh, we've chosen as a company internally to also have a very powerful, you know, policy. Um, but the fidelity bond protects against loss of principal funds. So it, it's a, it, it's not a common license. I, I don't. There's only a few in the state that I'm aware of, uh, and that is the California regulation. So. If we do fund control in Nevada, it's not as robust of a license, but it's a different license. Uh, and uh, there's a few other states on the East Coast that have similar provisions. The rest of the state's pretty um, pretty wide open. They're mm -hmm. not really – usually when we tell them we're regulated by the DBO in California, that's satisfactory. Uh, so it's really concentrated – West Coast, East Coast, as far as regulation. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, where you see a lot of activity right now. So, obviously, you're nationwide, um, and you do your own projects here in California. What uh, what areas are you seeing that are really hot? Well, uh, the East Bay is exploding in has for the last few years. This is the spillover effect of the overly expensive uh, San Francisco or Peninsula. Where you know the young new workforce is a high tech industry cannot afford five thousand dollar a month Victorian shack apartment <laughs> that they have to share with three other people mm -hmm. with a common bathroom. So you know it it's the spillover effect. So um, East Bay, uh, especially apartments and condos, have really been uh, I think the top in the country. As far as new development, our rehabbing, our apartment conversion condos, so it's definitely an explosive market there. I assume that will last as long as the economy of San Francisco that is in its own bubble will sustain itself. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of jobs coming out of there, so that is the appeal. And there is a great mass transit connecting East Bay to San Francisco that makes it very viable. So there's a lot of I mean, it's been developing over time. So the East Bay is just a very good hot spot right now for condos. i just curious now, since we're on condos, are, have you worked on any projects yet, like uh, co-living or micro-apartments? Um, 
I've seen a few of those projects popping up in San Francisco. Just curious if you have any experience. Yeah, it's a real trend right now uh, nationwide, usually in densely populated areas like San Francisco. But, uh, we are seeing it in the East Bay. Carlos Pozola, our CEO of Dope Vic, he uh, uh, has a Dope Vic project that he is sponsoring co-living um, around an incubator. Um, it's going to be pretty much one of the first of its kind. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it allows for that uh, micro-living, you know, co-living. That's when you have your own private room and then you have a big common area space with a big, you know, almost commercial-sized kitchen. And you have a place where you can play pool and hang out or go to almost like a business dinner in a hotel and do work and then, you know, be around like-minded people, usually younger or older after their kids have moved out, but, you know, want to thrive off other people. And and so the idea of combining that co-living with a business incubator, um, uh, specifically around a theme, you know, whatever that theme is, is kind of the trend that Carlos sees, and he's going to, he's actively involved in one in Oakland, but, Interesting. So, so you're talking about in the same building, sort of like a, a mixed use to where their housing and the people who are working for the company, maybe on the ground floor is office space and they just have to take the stairs or elevator downstairs and get to work, huh? Yeah, exactly. Well, it's funny if you go to countries like China, uh, a lot of the people that they import from the China's interior to work some of the labor jobs, they have huge dormitories in the background. I was fascinated visiting China doing that. So it's not a new concept, but what I think is interesting about co-living, it really almost takes like a, a hotel or a, I, I worked as an entertainment on a cruise ship in my 20s. And uh, I laugh because some of these property managers like is, on the cruise ship, we had an entertainment director where their sole job was to plan things for people to do. And the concept of co-living has, you know, we see it in senior living, but now in one co-living space, you could have, you know, a group of 45 and older single individuals, you know, living in the same space and sharing that co-living space. But you could also be in a building where, you know, on the second floor is, you know, a group of millennials. It's, you almost have to have a coordinator to match up personalities, which I find interesting. So, um, well, it is, and it's not for everyone, but um, if you're a young professional going from a college dormitory to co-living, and it, the, I mean, the crossover isn't that hard. I mean, it's probably an, an ideal situation for you, especially in a very expensive place to live. The most recent project I saw up in, I think it was in San Francisco, I mean, I think the room was $2,600 a month, and each of the co-living spaces had three bedrooms, a bathroom, and the interior space that they were building looked straight out of HDTV. I mean, it was stunning. The co-living space, the kitchen was beautiful, a huge family room, an open concept, but man, I it was awesome. And $2,600 sounds like a steal in, uh, <laughs> in the San Francisco market for something new. It really does, right? That's phenomenal. <laughs> well, yeah. well see, I mean, we've done a few flood control projects. And it, can, it gets back to that adaptive reuse concept we talked about last show, where uh, we took a, a church that sat abandoned on a prime corner in San Francisco with beautiful lead glass and no one did anything with it. And no church wanted it because of the, probably the cost of repairs and seismic upgrades that would be required. But you know, some guy came in and said, these high ceilings right in the center of the building would make a perfect common area. And there were wood beams and big lead glass windows. And he made this beautiful, over-the-top, high-luxury common area that you would love to live in. And then along the sides were little 250 square feet bedrooms basically so uh, how interesting great. okay yeah and some people refer to that as micro living there's a projects in rhode island and i forget the name off the top of my head of what the project is called but it's the oldest mall in america still standing it's three stories in the top two floor micro apartments 250 square feet tiny tiny living area it's connected to a little micro kitchen a bathroom a desk and a, a little bedroom and that's it you're not sharing a huge living space so you're you're missing the huge family room and commercial kitchen but one of the other things that's interesting about the co-living is it's typically surrounded with services like a maid service um you get you know internet included as well as utilities it just makes it really easy so they're taking out the friction of 
being a renter, which is interesting. Yeah. And as a developer, you can consider this. You know, a lot of developers avoid maybe a co-living because they don't want to manage it. Uh, uh, but there are, you know, some larger companies that do this. There's one called Open Door. Mm-hmm. I think it's opendoor.io. Uh, they manage co-living spaces, I think, across the nation. So, I mean, what we once thought wouldn't make sense or wouldn't be received well by the marketplace or we just didn't want to manage it after we finished it. There's a lot more options for that space right now. After the downturn, did you see other states do some heavy regulation like the state of California did? Well, there was a reaction in Florida to condo development, um, and that was because they just had so many. Um, they got they got around the pre-sales, you know, they don't have quite the restrictions we do here in California. We have a system of colored slips. We call it pink slip, yellow. Um, you know, Florida kind of beat up the process there of accepting deposits uh, too soon in the development cycle. Basically, they wanted to make sure that, you know, the actual project got built before you took people's money. So uh, we saw that. Um, the, the one that still just surprises me altogether is just how unaffected Texas was throughout this whole thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, a little teeny bit, but basically they kept building apartments. And, you know, when they build apartments in Texas, it's not a 20 unit, it's like a 1500 unit uh, complex. And uh, these are practical cities. So the price never really escalated during the, the up cycle. It didn't really drop in the down cycle. It just kept going. And uh, a lot of people looked at that and said, well, we want that. And uh, if you look at the underpinnings of that, well, there, it's not heavily regulated at all. It doesn't have the same market swing. And yeah. In attractive quality of California, because those swings are actually what create equity with property that we cash out or pull out to invest in something else. It's a balancing act again. Yeah, well, it's Texas was actually one of the states we 1031 exchanged into in 05 and 06 before the downturn, and we shared all that in our timing report because Texas is typically counter cold to what California does, and it just is sort of a steady rain. So. Oh. When it comes to funds control, what are the biggest mistakes that you think get caught because of the process? The biggest thing, well, for in California, for example, you don't want to use fund control that doesn't have a drug control escrow license because there's the potential that the state could seize those assets because the business is you know, illegally operating. So you want to make sure you're working with the properly licensed uh, drug control escrow company. So uh, that's number one. Uh, Number two is um, it's really the listening to the funds control company. I, I can't say this enough. It's not like trying to pass off blame here, but really what happens is there's usually tension because you have a borrower that you like. Maybe they've done a couple projects with you. You want to keep them and uh, keep them as a borrower. And, you know, they're like, I need my money now. And you're like, well, you call up the funds control company. Hey, you know, what's going on? Well, they haven't given us a lien release that we need. So, okay, well, go ahead and release it anyway, and I'll just follow up. Uh, that's the breakdown. You know, uh, we've got to, and maybe there is a case for that. I'm not saying there isn't, but it's usually, if all the backup isn't there, then, you know, you really got to measure the risk of releasing funds. Ahead of that, um, the common problem too, is especially with the smaller builders and rehabbers, is uh, I need cash now, and they really do. I mean, they don't have cash flow, right? They're, mm-hmm. they're just one, one job to the next, right? So they say, I need uh, pick a number twenty thousand close of escrow, uh, and they may really need that to buy the materials to get started. Uh, mobilize pay day laborers because they don't have that money. But technically, you're not supposed to do that. You know, now you're giving away money ahead of work. That, that is a potential problem. So um, I, I would say the biggest downfall is uh, measuring the risk and managing it appropriately for those that uh, don't follow the rules correctly. So um, it's 
this leads into a really great conversation that I definitely want to, we have about eight minutes, uh, inflation and California the like the builders are just starting to put a fire under it. And there is going to be a lot of pressure from private lenders. If they're still in the lending space on lending on construction, because there's a sense of arrogance and everything, maybe arrogance is the wrong word, but everything works. And why wouldn't you prefund things? I, I had a conversation like that yesterday. There was a sense of like, well, why wouldn't you give me 100% of the purchase price? Uh, I'm going to tear down the building to one wall and a foundation. Um, <laughs> and so I'm like, I have to explain that to a lender, a private money lender, who's going to put aside $500,000 of after-tax dollars for you to build this project. You're telling me you want me to fund the full 500000 You're going to take it down to the, you know, one wall and a foundation. What if you walk away? You know, you know I know right. you're, you're saying you're going to put $300,000 down, but at that moment in time, <laughs> I've got to be able to explain to the lender, this is a fantastic risk for you. <laughs> so, right. and yeah. by the way, thank I wanted you. to say thank you because you have been in uncomfortable situations where we've had borrowers that were definitely under pressure and you guys were a fantastic third party and took some heat and provide us a, some intel. It's, it is a really important relationship in the mix to have that visibility and control. So uh, you guys have been awesome to work with over the years. So anyway, to the inflation well, stuff, thanks. let's get to that. Well, inflation is huge. And it's only going to become a bigger problem as the next couple of years progress. And that is because of the fires. Yeah, uh, I, I didn't even never, think about that. How many yeah, houses got burned never, down? There's like 7,000. Uh, oh, my local. gosh. So we are looking at a building boom. And I experienced something very similar with the Oakland Hills fire many years ago. And we were doing funds control back then, uh, and we were, you know, we're headquarters in Oakland, so that was right there. And and we noticed some trends. Uh, one is if the average homeowner was over uh, sixty, mm-hmm. they took their insurance money and sold their lot and moved to a retirement community or out of state. Uh, there's a lot of Bay Area uh, folks fleeing to Nevada, Carson City, you know, um, because of those state income tax and the lower cost of living. And so, uh, so there's that, and that creates an opportunity for builders to buy lots. Well, because the utility in, stuff. in your experience right now, or at least in that Oakland fire, what percentage rate is, in your experience, the insurance providers cashing out and what could a potential builder or real estate investor come in and possibly make that consumer whole so they can go on and they could get full market price? Uh, we weren't seeing a lot of that. I mean, if, you, if you're the mindset, and again, it was based really on age, but if you're in the mindset of, hey, I just got a big check from the insurance company, probably more than they thought, and I can sell the lot and make another couple hundred thousand, there was very little pressure and maybe even downward pressure, like, yeah, let's hurry up and sell that one. So I, I think from a builder perspective, there was a lot of speculation going on. People running around saying, hey, I'll give you cash for the lot. It, um, it, it wasn't represented well. It wasn't like there were a ton of listings by brokers trying to hit the maximum price. Hmm. There wasn't any of that going on. It was, let's cash out, let's take the money we're out of here. Uh, for those that stay and want to rebuild, the other problem was there wasn't sufficient insurance funds to rebuild. Mm. And that was exacerbated by the fact that there was so much contractor fraud going on. And that is because, uh, it, this is not to say I blame the insurance companies. The insurance companies want to hurry up and do their payoffs because that's what they're supposed to do. So, you know, you own a property, you have a mortgage on the property, let's call it, you know, 400000 Um, Insurance company writes a joint check to you and the mortgage company. We're done. We're out of here. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did our job. And they did. Uh, now you got to decide, do I pay off my mortgage and then have to go find new money to build? Or does the mortgage company work with me? And... I think the environment in Santa Rosa right now, uh, largely due to um, civic leaders, uh, which we're trying to be actively involved in as a company, but there are some uh, 
some big names that have popped up and are really trying to create an environment of expedited permits, of mortgage companies working with homeowners that want to rebuild. Like, you know, let's not let's not take a full payoff right now. Let's, you know, do some sort of new construction financing where they can start rebuilding and defer payments to the back end. And so it's a healthy environment than we had in previous disasters. Uh, and let's hope that continues. And I, I really do. But the opportunity uh, for lenders and investors is the twofold. One, it's those lots that the older people just sell off and now builders want to build on it. So ground up construction. Uh, spec build. And then you have what's really going to happen is there's not going to be sufficient insurance funds to rebuild the property. And we saw a lot of construction seconds, private money seconds, Mm -hmm. coming in to finish the project. And uh, then they get refied out when it's all done, signed off. Um, But those those were the opportunities we noticed in the Oakland Hills fire. Okay. And... Obviously, besides the politics, when you are dealing with a disaster of that size, 7,000 homes burned down, um, labor, um, does that, I mean, we're already dealing with before the fires, labor shortages here in California. I, I did a rehab and I was having a very difficult time for specialty things like laying tile. I had to call in favors and the, the guy was cutting tile at eight o'clock in the morning and ticking off the neighbors. <laughs> so, uh, do, do you expect people to relocate from out of state and migrate to the area to build those 7,000 homes or what do you see? Yeah. Inflation, it's going to be off the charts. I mean, there's just not enough skilled labor, our material supplies to satisfy the demand coming our way. And, uh, it's going to, it's going to be bad. Um, even before this, we were noting that larger projects had a brand new line item on the construction budget. And it was right after contingency. So you got your line item budget, subtotal contingency. Now, people argue over the amount it should be, but general rule is on the 10% larger projects, 3 to 5%. Um, then there was this new line item, and it was just simply noted inflation. Oh no! And inflation made the <laughs> inflation made the light item. <laughs> it did, and we were seeing uh, we were seeing then three percent. And these are larger projects, but essentially, if you're looking at a two-year build-out for like a school or a correctional facility, and you know the price today is not going to be the price tomorrow, and so they were accounting for that right there in their budget. Interesting. Well, you believe so much in that that you are opening a field office in the Santa Rosa area. Is that what you said? Absolutely. Uh, so you're going to be busy. This, this, yeah, this won't just be our funds control company, as we talked about last show. This is our development services company. This is really for someone who's already an emotional wreck uh, coming in to say, I, how do I do this? I mean, what is the process? The process is, well, we'll, we'll get... You know, we'll get a plan together, we'll get it designed, we'll get it submitted to the city, get the approvals and the permits, and we'll help you bid it out, and, you know, uh, we can build it for you and find a qualified contractor. So those are some of it. It's really just uh, some hand-holding through a pretty difficult process. I mean, most people will never have to build their own home, so we want to be there to help. Yeah, I was a. I did. I'm glad you brought that up. So, Bill Dig, besides the funds control, that is something that you'll also do is plan review and and help people understand sort of the scope of a project and what they need, which is probably going to be very needed in that an area for the next several years. So, maybe yeah, in a absolutely. Well, we're out of time, but uh, maybe in you know a few months, I'd love to have you back to sort of see how that's working and how you're seeing the area and inflation uh, progress uh, progress because this is a really interesting scenario. Yeah, I'd love to be back anytime. Well, John, uh, if people want to get a hold of you, um, how should they go about doing so? Well, we're at uh, we're online at buildzig.com, and the main phone number is 800-380-0180. Well, I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, John. 
For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com.